Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of the Motherkind podcast with me your host Zoe Blasky where each week I chat about all things motherhood and well-being. My mission with this podcast is to help you reconnect to you, to feel happier, more joyful, calmer and that little bit kinder to yourself because I think life as a mum in this hectic modern world is hard enough as it is. I believe becoming the happiest, most alive version of ourselves is the most important and inspiring thing we can do for our children. Hi everyone, welcome to this week's episode with me, your host, Zoe Blasky. Have you heard of sophrology? No, well, I hadn't actually either until I started preparing for this interview. And now I've got to say, having just spoken to this week's guest and done a fair bit of research on it, I am pretty excited about it. So sophrology is a dynamic meditation practice. The Guardian calls it the dynamic young cousin of mindfulness. And The Independent said, while many people try and fail to reap the benefits of meditation, taking up sophrology could be the key to unlocking your mind's potential. Dominique Antilio is the world's leading sophrologist. She's a best-selling author and the founder of Be Sophro, which is a global sophrology platform. She is also a mum to five-year-old Elliot. Dominique specialises in stress management, anxiety reduction and burnout prevention. Three things that I think every mother on the planet probably needs. So sophrology can be done lying down, sitting, standing up, and even while moving. It's a practice that combines breath work, meditation, visualization, and light body movement to engage the body and the mind. And generally, practicing it teaches you how to become more mindful of your needs, something I know many of us struggle with, your strengths, your limits, and your capabilities so that we can create more capacity within ourselves to better handle life's challenges. So I loved both learning about sophrology and getting to know Dominique. She's incredibly inspiring. And I think you'll agree, I found her energy really calming and grounding. I loved the conversation this morning. So we talk about, of course, what sophrology is and how she got into it. And then we have a fascinating conversation about Dominique's decision not to have any more children and how she's made peace with that. We also talk about burnout and how with both of us, you know, working for ourselves, running our own businesses, how we can not do that in a way that's going to cause us to burn out. And she has this mantra, which I'm stealing. I love it, which is I set the pace. And I think even if you don't work for yourselves, you know, we get to set the pace, don't we, in our lives, how many play dates we book in, how hard we make it for ourselves, how many weekend plans we try and jam in, how many guests we allow to come and visit us in our homes and on and on and on. So I love this mantra of I set the pace of my life. I think it was a really calming episode and really perspective giving episode. So here it is. I hope you love it. As ever, if you did, please do share it. Please do rate. Please do review. Let's get the word out there. Let's support more and more mothers with our mother kind mission. Here it is. Welcome Dominic to the podcast. I'm so excited to be chatting this morning. Thank you, Zoe. I'm super happy to be here. So I don't normally start here, but I think because of what we're going to talk about, which is sophrology, let's start right at the start, which is what is this practice and how did you come to be Europe's leading voice promoting the practice? So sophrology, in essence, is part of the family of meditative practices. It's an alternative to traditional meditation, and it's a tool to empower you in your daily life. Basically, it's a practice that involves relaxation, breathing, visualization, and a little bit of movement. And the practice is a blend of Eastern practices and philosophies like yoga and meditation and Zen meditation with Western science like psychology, phenomenology, psychiatry, because it was put together by a psychiatrist to understanding the mind and how the mind functions and the emotions. And so sophrology takes in a way the best of all these things and tailor it for our modern life, which is becoming more and more complicated to handle as an individual and to know where to go to tap into your inner resources and be able to 
do whatever it is that you want to do in your life. So it's really a toolbox in a way for empowerment. And you discovered it when you were just 15, didn't you? I did. I did. I went through a a tough time at the time. I was a student. I was in Switzerland, my home country. And I, you know, I was playing a lot of sports at the time competitively in basketball and I was going to school. I wasn't enjoying school, but I think I was basically not even allowed to tell myself that I wasn't enjoying the process. I think the way I had been raised and the environment I was in. And uh, suddenly it's my body who who started to fail me in the way I became very tired. I had this recurrent infection in my body that came from nowhere. And I had to take so many antibiotics to clear them and it would never work. I was always tired. And I went to see my GP at the time. We did all sorts of tests. I was even fainting. So I had fainting episode on the way to school or in circumstances that were very difficult for me to manage. And I couldn't play basketball anymore. So I went to my GP and after all sorts of tests and trying different things, which never really worked, we sent me to a sophrologist. And I had never heard of what a sophrologist is. (laughs) And he said, why don't you go to see this lady in town? She's wonderful. I heard she's helped a lot of my patient, and I think you should talk to her. So I went to her, I was 15, you know, I had never done therapy. I didn't come from a background of therapy in my family for sure. So talking about emotion, talking about what you feel was very new to me. And somehow she managed to give me the space for the first time to talk about myself and how I felt in the process of everything I was living at the time. And she gave me those very simple exercises based on relaxation, breathing, visualization, and movement. And she recorded them on a tape. And uh, you know those tapes at the time, (laughs) a long time ago. And she said, just practice, go home. And every lunchtime when you come back from school, you will practice this, yeah? And uh, then come back and see me next week. And I think I was so desperate and I found her so nice that I thought, okay, I can do that. I'm going to try, yeah? And I did. And, you know, very quickly I realized, gosh, I have never felt that my tummy can expand when I breathe. Uh, I have never felt the difference between sitting or standing, how it feels in my body. I've never used a movement to process an angry feeling or a sadness or just to realize I'm actually sad. And that's started to build my journey of awareness and how I could, for example, use visualization to empower me for the next basketball game or for the next exam at school. And uh, after five weeks, I completely recovered. After months of trying all sorts of things, I was completely back to normal with my energy, no more fainting. And I was back to normal. And I, not only normal, but I think for the first time I felt what it means to be empowered, that suddenly, you know, even my teacher was still the same and I was still complaining about my environment. But for the first time, I had perspective and I had understood, all right, I'm not stuck in this forever. And I can also decide how I'm going to view these people, how I'm going to interact with them and how I'm going to make myself heard or understood better. Yeah. So it gave me a massive dose of empowerment very early on. That was the beginning of my journey as a teenager. Yeah. So that seed was planted at 15, but it took you then a few years to come full circle to make this now your life's purpose and mission what happened in between (laughs) yeah so loads of things happen you know at the time becoming a sophrologist didn't seem like a serious job so I had to go to university (laughs) and uh, I was very happy because I chose something that I was very passionate for many years which was osteopathy so I came to England from Switzerland and I studied in one of the great school you, you have in this country in the south of England and for four years I studied osteopathy and I had a bachelor in osteopathy and then I came back to Switzerland and I opened my osteopathic practice which I did for many years 
12 years, I think. And I was, um, you know, working with families, with kids. I was specializing in babies and toddlers, osteopathy. And I, you know, I loved it. But, you know, I was still doing my journey as a sophologist on the side, as a hobby, really, for myself, but also then studying with the founder of sophology, Alfonso Caicedo, who's a who was a neuropsychiatrist in Spain, and I was very lucky to train under him and to really go in the depths of what is sophrology as a philosophy, as a method for self-development and a method for consciousness. I think it's about 12 years ago now. I thought, okay, now I think I'm finished with this work with my hands. It felt like I was getting bored in my career as an osteopath, And I felt I have something else now that I can give to people that comes from a deeper place inside myself about empowerment and how sophology can help them in their daily life. So they don't rely so much on uh, therapists like osteopaths, which I still myself go to and I totally endorse. But I think having that depth of awareness is really helping to heal as well as getting body works. I really feel that there's another layer that we can contact inside ourselves that informs every aspect of the experience, including healing. And that's it. And then I sold my practice and I convinced my husband was a good idea to go to London, which took me a long time. (laughs) But finally, he said yes. And we came 10 years ago. Now this summer, it's going to be 10 years. With a few bucks, we had sold everything. And I said, let's do this. Let's see if we can succeed in London and do a life there. Because I love this city. I love the multicultural. I love the opportunity. And I saw this huge gap in the world of sophology where it's so well known in Switzerland. It's reimbursed by the health insurance. It's in hospital. It's in private clinics to help patients with insomnia, with anxiety, with depression. It's used by the sports world a lot in France and Switzerland and Belgium. So yeah, realizing how popular this practice was in continental Europe and that basically in London, Nobody has almost heard of it at the time. And uh, still now it's quite niche, yeah, it's expanding. But, you know, we are the beginning of bringing the technique over in English-speaking countries. You talked about the philosophy. Is it like meditation? Is it kind of based in an Eastern philosophy? Is it religious at all? What is the philosophy of it then? Because it's quite modern, really. In the 1960s, it was developed, right? So the philosophy is really about having a tool, a practical tool that taps into all the resources that we have inside ourselves. So the founder studied consciousness. Basically, he was back in the 60s in a hospital in Madrid, and he was witnessing all the difficult treatment people with mental health issues had at the time, like insulinic comas and like electric shock, for example, back in the 60s, you know, they were using this very, very harsh technique to help people. And he said there must be a way to help people feel better without damaging a part of their consciousness through this very tough method. So he went on this journey of trying to understand what consciousness is. And to this day, of course, we haven't got the answer yet. But at the time, he was really pioneering this because nobody ever talked about consciousness. Even in psychiatry world, consciousness was not even really mentioned in their studies. So he decided to start to study it and study it in its ill health, but also in his great function. For example, going to India and witnessing how monks, Buddhist monks, use meditation and what is the effect of these practices on consciousness and how do they then feel and perceive the world through these practices. Same for yogis, same for the yoga of the sound of the voice. And so he he spent a lot of time observing these people, even met the Dalai Lama and had, you know, empowering conversation. And then he came back to Madrid and he started to shape the first three levels of sophology, which are really the tools to start to explore your own consciousness and bring harmony. So we start with the body always, and we start to learn how can I connect to myself through the sensation of my body? Because most of us in life, 
we go through life and it's only when our body are aching or when we're lying in bed with the flu, having done too much, suddenly we feel, oh my God, what have I done to my body? I think maybe I need to pause a little bit. But what if we could simply listen to our body on a daily basis more through very easy way of focusing on the different parts of doing a few moves that just gives you a check-in and a useful way to connect and also to learn to listen to the positive sensation we have in the body because there's a whole part of consciousness that can empower us and this sense of relaxation we can feel in the muscle when we practice or this sense of tingling or energy flow that we can sometimes connect when we deeply relax that's also a source of empowerment in every day so the first step is all about using the practice to connect you with your body And then the journey carries on with the mind. How can you become aware of what your mind does and how you can focus it better? How can you learn to gain perspective through a different visualization exercise, but also body awareness exercise? And then when you know a little bit about your body and you know a bit about your mind, how this experience can fit into the landscape of your consciousness, then we bring the two together and we start to meditate. Because a lot of people would like to meditate, would like to access to this amazing place where you become the observer of your sensation without judgment. But most of us, we're running on adrenaline, running around, and we ask ourselves to suddenly sit down and be able to meditate. And then we feel guilty because we don't manage which is crazy if you think about it. So I think knowing yourself a little bit better and creating, so Florigy creates that bridge between the modern life and what we experience to be able to draw you into that space with guidance and with a way that's going to help you to get to that space. And there's definitely no religious connotation or connection with sophology. It's really a practice that's born in the medical world that has scientific evidence, notably on the effect of sophology on depression and anxiety. All the studies around breathing, around movement, they're also valid for sophology because this, these are the tools we use. So how do you practically do it? Is it a set time every day, like TM or something like that? Is it a set system I think there's 12 levels I've been researching how do you know which level to access when how does it practically look if someone wants to get started so I think it's about what feels comfortable for you on a daily basis Most of my clients really start with a five-minute practice on the go, sitting in the car whilst waiting or just at your desk like I did this morning. I just stand and do a few moves, a few breathing. So you're guided by a voice, so the voice of your sophologist, the voice of a recording, and you often invite it to close your eyes, either standing, sitting, or even lying down, depending on how you feel, where you are, and what you like to do. And then you follow usually a structure that always starts with a short body scan, different simple moves combined with a breathing exercise to just become more aware of what you feel in your body and how you can start to shift the tension you may feel, you know, emotional tension, physical tension, frustration, emotion, whatever goes on for you that day, are you able to recognize them and then perhaps start to play with them a little bit and see where these things can they flow in a different way? Can you? And the, the exercise are very strong because they're combining the breathing and the intention. And as you know, as soon as you put your intention somewhere, things start to happen, yeah? And then perhaps you're going to do a few standing moves to activate the energy of your body to start to balance body and mind. And then you might finish off with a visualization about your upcoming exam or that dreaded time where your child goes in a tantrum and you know it's going to happen in the evening. So how can you prepare for this ahead? Deciding to cultivate perhaps a sense of calm or understanding or self-love and seeing yourself in the most positive way, going through that tantrum time, being able to deal with it in the way that perhaps you'd like to be able to deal and not feeling stuck that every time this happens, you're going to go back and you're going to 
be unhappy about it and you're going to beat yourself about it. So, you know, those very practical modern life situation that we would like to be able to deal with and we're not trying to deal with them with the mind and trying to reason I'm doing this because my child is like this and because I have no patience or because I should do better or because I'm not a good mom or you know it's about closing the eyes and letting another part of yourself which is the whole resource of consciousness showing you the way which is a non analytical way of dealing with life i think that's so important because most of us have too many tabs open in our brains right we're thinking 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 all day long and i think yes, there's yes. a real power in dropping out of our minds into our bodies it's fascinating as you were talking getting to learn a little bit more about it because i do a little routine every morning which includes a few stretches a bit of yoga meditation and visualization visualization is really important to me i'm always picturing in my head what i want to happen i'm picturing myself handling things really That's well wonderful. and so it's, it's fascinating to hear that really it sounds like sophology is a system that puts those things together but yes. has some structure around it because i do those three things separately yes. i just kind of designed my intuitively own yes that's beautiful yeah. and that what works for you you know and i think that's the message of sophology we're trying to adapt to people's life and people what they feel like doing the time they have instead of saying you should sit down to do this you should spend that amount of time and you know as a mom this doesn't work because every day is so different and uh, they're going to be always something that just derail from the plan so maybe we should just let go of the plan and try to notice when is it that i have this moment and take your chance when it's there how has your practice supported you through the challenges of motherhood you've got five year olds haven't you yeah i think it's definitely helped me i think on every aspect i think most importantly because i've been practicing sophology for so long i think what it helped me to do is to clarify ahead of motherhood because of all the self development work i had to do for my own health and my own life and my own healing is to understand what is important to me in my life what are the values that i want to stay connected to through motherhood and i think this has guided my journey and being able to sometimes be distracted but also knowing okay now i'm getting distracted from the way i want to live or the way i value things so okay what is important here and when these founding value of my life are nourished through what i do in everyday life i feel that I'm okay. The stress on top of that can be a little bit more superficial and therefore okay, I have many bad nights with Elias coming to wake me up in the middle of the night because he's lost his teddy bear. <laughs> and of course that's normal. You know it's part of motherhood. But then I think yeah, I'm going to rest a bit the next day this morning. I put Elias uh, to school and then I came back home and through I lie down for half an hour. I did listen to podcast you you you've done before and I just stay there for a good hour just resting because the last three nights I've been a bit rock and roll and it's okay, you know. <laughs> What can you do? I mean, you, are you going to fight it and be angry about it or are you going to celebrate the fact that this is motherhood? and now is the time to enjoy it is now the time to enjoy it yeah it's now or never yeah and having that realization helps me to stay in the present moment with elliot and i don't say it's easy i just say this helps me constantly to rethink my perspective as i go through the experience what are your values what are those things that are really important to you i think it's being able to be the mother i want to be as well as carry on being the woman i want to be and contribute to this world with what makes me happy in my work i always wanted to be able to have those two reality 
together. Even when I was much younger, I, I hesitated doing, for example, uh, uh, medicine. Yeah, and I visited a hospital at the time, and for summer. I went to visit every part of the hospital and I remember that there was an amazing doctor there. She sat down at the break for midday and she had her nanny coming to give the child to breastfeed. And then I said, wow, this is intense. Yeah, I've seen you working the whole morning. Now you're breastfeeding. So what's going on? How are you coping with this? It's a lot. Yeah. And she started to cry. And I was so young, you know, and I think her care question might, might be far too direct. But when you're young, maybe you ask those questions yeah? <laughs> and you get away with it. And she was like, you know, I've studied so hard. I've done 12 years of medicine to get into that seat. And now I'm so conflicted because I love my children and I can't be a good mother. I can't be a good doctor because there's always, I'm always detracted. And that stayed with me, you know, from 17 onwards, I said, you have to choose something you like in your life that will allow you to be flexible. And I think I have managed to get that flexibility. And when I have this guilt trip about, oh, do I do enough stuff with Elliot? Or really, I should do a bit more of this for my business. I try to remember that I set the pace. I set the pace of the experience. And perhaps it's going to take me three more years to get where I want to go with my sophrology. But that's okay. I'm going to get there. And I just can set the pace that's in my own power. I think that's helped me a lot along the way to reconcile. And I think it's sophology that has helped me to think like that because it's, it's allowed me to, you know, on other notes, more practical notes. I think it's like every mother, you want to see your child thriving. You want to be there for them when they need you. And even if it's difficult and there are bad days, it's being able to be there for them when they, they need you most. That's a, such an important part of my experience with Elliot. That was so powerful for me to hear you say, I set the pace. It's such a good reminder for me. And then you said it might take me another three years. I'm a recovering overachiever, overworker. And I think sometimes when you work for yourselves, like, you know, you and I do, and the opportunity is so big in my world yeah. and your world, does that intention and coming back to that, I set the pace, does that dissolve that conflict for you? Because I imagine you are thrown a lot of opportunities your way, probably a lot of travel, a lot of corporate stuff. You know, I know you've just done the book. I imagine that. <laughs> How do you keep coming back to that, I set the pace mantra? And does it knock you off course? Do you feel that conflict? Because I know I do most days. I'm having to say no to something that actually I kind of want to do, but I want to be with the girls more. So there's always this conflict. It's a constant reminder I have to tell myself, you know. When Elliot was born, I was very proud of me because I was able to close my practice for three months before giving birth. And I was like, yes, I managed to let go <laughs> and really give space to the end of my pregnancy and really making the most of that time. And then, you know, the first few months of having a young child, I mean, everybody knows how difficult it is and what a shocking experience it is to suddenly having to provide for a little human being and being worried about what's gonna happen next and uh, you know all that those huge feelings so I was dealing with all that stuff being really at peace and realizing gosh thanks god I've closed my practice momentarily because I think I would never be able to actually deal with this plus client asking me to support them. I mean, I was not able to do that. But then this book offer came along. I received a, an email one morning. I was breastfeeding and I was far away from my job. And it's Yellow Kite just saying, would you like to write a book out of absolutely nowhere? And I think I didn't realize I was so worried about Elliot and breastfeeding and all that stuff. I went to that meeting in this two hour gap you have for between two feet. And I hadn't even looked who this publisher was. I just told me, I'm just going to show up, be there, and we'll see. And it was not my top priority at all. And then I went to this meeting. And afterwards, I realized, gosh, this is a real offer. They're giving me something amazing. Maybe I should stop and consider this a bit more seriously. And that's how the whole journey started for me like three years ago with bringing sophology to a wider audience and that's it so there's been time 
until a year ago where, yes, I have struggled to know exactly what are the priority in my business, what are the things I should say yes to, and what is not that important after all. And I think it's only perhaps since a year now that I've had more time. I think Elliot is a bit older as well, so he's less of an involvement like when you have a newborn. And, you know, now I can go back to applying this mantra of, you know, I set the pace because sometimes you just don't and you you carry the way. But it's very important to at least at some point to go back to that space and take control because otherwise you will burn out. Yeah, you, you'll just burn out. And what do you get from that? Yeah, you cannot continue anything. You cannot be a mother. You cannot do what you like. You cannot see your friend and I always remember Ariana Huffington when she, in her interview, she was saying about her experience of burnout. And she said, I could have built exactly the same empire, but without burning out. She said, I think I could have done it differently. And you don't have to burn out in order to succeed. And I'm trying to remind myself of this and there must be a way that the universe is going to provide you with the things you're meant to experience in your life. If you're a bit patient <laughs> and you let things be a bit more, this is maybe how you also attract the things that are really important and not the, all the, the agitation that we do in a daily life that actually, is it really productive? Is it really going to satisfy you? Is it worth your time? And I'm trying to always go back to these questions yeah and it's a constant question it's I don't think it ever stops yeah because <laughs> there's always new experience so you have to always upgrade your capacity to let go and to remind yourself of these important values it's so true and I funnily enough got the same email from a couple of publishers actually randomly within a week like three publishers emailed me I guess someone big must have shared my platform and people were like who is this <laughs> My second one was tiny and I was like, what am I going to do? You know, it just didn't feel like the right time. And I think I was reminded, I can't remember who reminded me of this, whether it was a podcast or my coach or, you know, about scarcity thinking, which is that this is the only chance and I have to do it or abundant thinking, which is actually the opportunities are always going to be there. Maybe not in the same way. Maybe it'll be a different publisher, but actually true alignment is when, it feels right for everyone. And I actually turned down those offers, which is huge for me because it's been the biggest thing on my vision board ever to write a book. Wow, that's brave, yeah. Yeah, and I think it has to feel in alignment, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. And sometimes we we do mistake and we go for these half good choices and then we pay the price quite high, don't we? Because we sleep less we're angry and we, <laughs> you know, it's hard, but I think it's also the way you learn, you know, I had to accept all these experience for the first two years after publishing because it taught me public speaking. It's taught so much, you know, so I'm so grateful in a way I did say yes for all of this, because this is the only way you learn and you also expand your skills and you understand where you are, what you've landed in and that you can you know, make things work, but you can't always be in that mode. Otherwise it's burnout. Yeah, exactly. And I think burnout is whether mothers are working or not, parental burnout, invisible labor burnout is huge. It's you know, huge. Do you experience that as well? How does your kind of domestic setup look like? You've got one child at the moment and I'm guessing, you know, you might get lots of questions about that because our society likes to do that right you have you, you, yes. you get married and they people say when are you having a child yeah. you have a child and they say when are you having the next the one? second one I know that's the always the question and you know I think for me I, I took a long time to, to think about that and I even you know I even saw a coach to help me really get down to the bottom of that question do I want another child and if yes why and if no why and how does it resonate not only with my mind but with my body with who I am to this day, trying to deprogram myself of what is expected from me, of what other parents are telling me. There's so much good reason to do several children and so many good reason to have one or have no kids, you know, and I respect all these decisions. 
And for me, I think I've now come to that realization that the essence of being a mother, I've got it with Elliot. Elliot's made me a mother. And everything we experience on a daily basis, I enjoy and I want to be able to be here to enjoy with him. If I had another child, I don't think I could be as comfortable in my role. I think I would feel stretched. I think I would start to to be out of balance. I wouldn't be able to, knowing myself, knowing how sensitive I am, knowing, and this is my strength, that sensitivity. So I also have to, it helps me in my work. It helps me in meeting people. It helps me, but that's something also I have to take into account. And I've learned from 15 year old that I'm a sensitive human being in many ways. And I look into the subtlety of things. And therefore, for me, the numbers doesn't matter. It's about the quality of the experience. And for me, having several kids, I think would mean losing a quality that I have at the moment. I don't see where I could have this quality because I think I would be stressed of organizing so much and being in charge and feeling under too much pressure to actually deliver. And I'm slowly getting to that point now where I'm at peace with my decision, yeah? That's what I was going to ask you. Interesting you used that word. I was about to say, do you feel at peace with that decision? I think I have the last few percentage to still work on. I think I have still a little bit. And if I don't take the opportunity when it's there, because we all have an age past, you know, the age that then you can't do it. But I think when I wanted Elliot, I knew it. I knew in my body, I knew I was so ready for it. And there was something inside me that had no fear, was so ready for the journey. And this second round, I don't think I have that. So I think I have to respect this thing. I don't think it would be wise to, I think if you want a child, it's a big responsibility. You're, you have to provide for them. You have to be there. It's a, it's a big thing to help a life come to flourish. So for me, I think I'm just going to make the most of what we have now and, and enjoy every moment of what we have and, and not stress too much about what people think and how I'm perceived and who cares at the end. I'm here with Elliot and, uh, <laughs> you know, people are not in my life to know how I feel. So I think that's the freedom we all have. Mm, thank you for sharing that. I think it's going to be really powerful with people to hear that. It's something I'm asked about a lot. And sometimes I run coaching sessions for people on that decision, you know, whether it's the first child, the second child, the third child, the fourth child. Yeah. I think it's really incredible actually to take the time to really reflect on that decision. We did it before we had our second. We didn't get a coach, but I kind of coached us through my husband and I. And we yes. used a tool that I use and we really, really thought about it. And I said to Guy, my husband, I said, I'm really proud of us because it would be very easy to just be like, well, everyone has two. Let's just have two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It'd be very easy yeah. to do that, right? Just like we do, you know, oh, everyone's stressed. You know, it's all right to be stressed or everyone's, yeah. you know, this kind of idea that we just go along with what society expects of us or what the norm is in society as opposed to what we actually want. And interestingly yeah. for Guy and I, what came up was that we both had so much fear. We both wanted it in our hearts when we could get the fear away. That feeling yeah. was there. Yes. That you just yes. that feeling yeah. being a bit absent for you. That feeling was there, but it was under layers and layers and layers of fear. Which is normal, you know, because I think this experience of motherhood Nothing can really prepare, you know, for this time, for this huge shift. And I also ask myself, is it fear that I have? See, if it's only fear, it's worth working through. Yeah, what are the fears? I just wanted to be honest with myself so that I can never look back and say, gosh, I mean, you should have done that. And I think I'm learning to trust myself that, you know, when I want something, generally, I go for it. Yeah, <laughs> so... If this hasn't become the top of my list, then that probably also means exactly. there's other priorities, yeah? Yeah, exactly. Um, but it's doing that introspection, isn't it, that's so yeah. powerful. And I'm guessing you work with a lot of mothers. What are some of the 
common challenges that you see coming up and how does your practice support those? I mean, the biggest challenge we've all seen recently was these lockdowns. I mean, I really feel for the parents that have had to juggle working from home with caring and teaching our children because, you know, I'm not a teacher and I don't think I'd like to be a teacher for Elliot. I'd rather be his mom and that's already a big enough job. So I think during the lockdown, I did a lot of live on Instagram for mothers and for everybody who felt overwhelmed. And I think sometimes just having those 15 minutes of closing your eyes, being guided and just reconnecting to whatever you feel on that day and having a tool to just transform how you feel and and reset with a sense of hope, with a sense of energy, with a sense of confidence you know, whatever the problem or the issue people face in their life, at the end, we all have these amazing resources inside us. And if we know how to connect to these resources, then we're going to find a way forward. And I think that's my job as a sophrologist is to give them those tools and allow them this time to connect and teach them something that they can then reproduce on their own, perhaps in the bath or at the kitchen table when everything becomes too much, you know? And I think it's all about the practice. It's really about knowing I have this practice and if I do this and I repeat these moves, I repeat this breathing, I repeat this intention, my brain's going to start to rewire. And I'm going to start to feel different. I'm going to start to gain perspective on the situation. I'm going to start to feel a new energy in my body and start to be able to tackle with more clarity what are the important things today or what are the boundaries I have to put in my daily life. And I think we all know that. We all know that inside of ourselves. But I think if we don't give ourselves the time to go there, how can we then expect us to know? I think it's very difficult. Then we're just kind of reacting. Yes. You know, and I've been there. I'm sure you have as well. When I don't take those 15 minutes to reset. I love that reconnect and reset. Interestingly, that's the names of my two coaching programs. Reconnect and reset. Yeah. Yes. Um, You know, if I don't take that time to reconnect and reset, I'm basically at the mercy of my monkey mind, which takes me on a roller coaster. And of what everyone wants around me. And it's horrible, that place where you're just lurching from kind of reacting as opposed to that, what you're describing through the practice is that kind of more grounded place where you can take a breath and say, right, what do I need to do? What's important? Let's do it calmly with intention. It's actually a totally different way to approach our days, isn't it? Yes. And I think... Sometimes when we have questions that are unsolved, like the question I was earlier telling you about, do I want another child? You can put the pros and cons on the paper, and that's going to give you a certain amount of valuable information. But at the end of the day, to really know what you have to do, you have to include the body, you have to include your emotion, you have to include the past, your relationship with your future, And all these components that are a little bit less from the mind and that can only emerge and become clear to you if you repetitively take five minutes to ask that question. And if you have a tool that can help you visualize yourself, for example, with a child, what does that do to you if you visualize yourself beyond in two years' time with a bigger family? How does that feel? Does it feel good? Does it feel... You know, all of these things and then not trying to reason too much, but just just going through the motion of the practice and then living your life and recognizing that the answer will phenomenologically, as we say, come to you. Sometimes it's the smallest thing that will give you an answer about what is the direction you have to take. You might have a conversation with someone giving you a new information and you're like, oh, yeah, that really resonates now. That answer is part of my question. And how come this person suddenly shows up in your life to talk about this? It's because you've been 
setting your intention and you've been asking this, this, this question in your practice, yeah? And the universe then aligns and helps you to get there, yeah? Somehow, I think. There's nothing rational behind what I'm saying. It's I'm, I'm talking from experience. And that's my experience of sophology. And I think everybody who's practicing would agree with me that there is another way of looking at life that is a little bit less one plus one equals two when we say in French yeah (laughs) you know that's how I live my life most of my healing and recovery came through a spiritual support group spiritual recovery so yeah I really live that way and it's still remarkable to me how when I let go of the control and the overthinking yeah I just hear the words that I'm meant to hear or a, a bus goes past me with exactly you know a phrase that is just perfect for me and it's not that that bus wouldn't have gone past. It's not that I manifested a bus going past. It's just no, that, I no- yeah. it's that I noticed it because yeah. I was out of my head. Yes. And then it was perfect. I mean, it's amazing to me how the power of letting go of that control of life and then what can come in Definitely. is beautiful. I always ask the same question at the end, which is if you could give just one gift to all the mothers in the world, what would that one gift be? And why? Oh, that's beautiful. I think I would give them a hug to let them know that I know. I know the pain and I know the joy and I know this experience. We belong to this field of mother together. We belong to that journey of motherhood as we go through it. And there's a very sacred, you know, energy that is about to be a mother, I think. Yeah, that beyond the daily business of being a mother. Mm, beautiful and how does someone learn more about you about sophrology you have some amazing free downloads on the website how does someone find all of that information so there's my book the life-changing power of sophrology that you can find on all the usual channels of finding books and besofro.com which is b-e-i-f-n-sofro s-o phro.com so be sofro and you've got videos there you've got free downloads you've got online courses that we do for stress management uh, for empowerment for sleep uh, and they are usually quite short and they give you a practice to do on a daily basis yeah so you're given a little video and then a little practice to do over a week and then the next week we add on the the layer yeah and layer by layer you discover this in a resource and you're able to unlock what it is that you want to unlock beautiful and instagram as well you're quite good on and instagram, instagram. Yeah, sharing, yeah. Don't forget that. yeah thank you yeah at this of london that's my instagram we do instagram lives there as well and there's also a community that you can be part of once you do a course with me then you you can be part of a community of people who practice sophology and we also do monthly practices there on different themes so tonight for example we're doing one on anger how do we deal with anger and how can we use anger to our benefit rather than thinking it's a bad emotion yeah <laughs> thank you so much honestly I, thank I'd you. love connecting thank you for your honesty and thank you. Um, yeah maybe we get to meet in person one day soon I would love <laughs> to definitely and thank you for having me and sending lots of love So that was the episode. I hope that you really enjoyed it. As ever, if you did, please consider sharing it with your friends and leaving me a review on iTunes. It really does make a difference to the number of mums that we can reach with the brilliant wisdom of the guests I have on. Also, just a reminder about the Family Reset Plan. It's my latest offering to parents. I think that we are living in probably the challenge of our lifetimes. Well, definitely so far. And as parents, we not only have to support ourselves, we also have to support our children. And that is a lot. So the Family Reset Plan is myself and two brilliant psychologists and we give you step-by-step, simple, applicable ways that you can support yourself emotionally to feel stronger, calmer, and therefore to support your children in a different way. It's all grounded in psychology and neuroscience. It's just £25 currently. And if you work for the NHS, it is totally free for you. So check out the website, familyresetplan.co.uk. Take care. I'll see you next time.